Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name's Mickey B- and I'm a fully conceded alcoholic. That's fully conceded, not conceited. As you may may think later on, I'm, uh, I identify as a fully conceited alcoholic because in the beautiful book Alcoholics Anonymous, this beautiful book, it says on page 30, we learned we had to fully concede to our innermost self that we were alcoholic. This is the first step in recovery. It's not the first of the 12 step. The first of the 12 steps is a totally different step which has nothing to do with admitting we're alcoholic. I call this the the step before the steps. So we learned we had to fully concede to our innermost self that we were alcoholic. This is the first step in recovery. And when I got here, I didn't know what it was. But today I do. I'm having a little gratitude attack right now. I don't know whether you can feel that, but I have gratitude attacks. Anybody know what I mean by gratitude attack? Yeah. Yeah. I never knew a thing about gratitude when I got here. Gratitude? What the hell was there to be grateful for, for heaven's sake? Gratitude? Screw gratitude and screw you in gratitude. But like the beautiful book says, I couldn't define the truth from the false and I didn't know the false and I didn't know nothing about gratitude. You know, the truth of the matter is I've had something to be grateful for ever since I was christened. My name's Mickey Mickey Think about that. Mickey That puts me somewhere between a mouse and a president. (laughs) Anywhere in that spectrum is where you're likely to find me at any given time. And I am really grateful they never named me Harry. You're a rotten lot laughing at that. Can you imagine going through life with a name like Harry? Yeah. So, <laughs> so I don't know, but I'm I'm really I'm I'm really grateful to be here. I'm having a little gratitude attack as we speak. You know, I'm glad to be here in Wichita. I don't know where I am, but I know I'm in Wichita, and uh, really glad to be here and uh, to be welcomed and. Uh, to be at the 40th anniversary. The 40th anniversary, what a gift. Happy, joyous, and free. So special, happy, joyous, and free. That's what God's will for me is. I know what God's will for me is. I know what God's will for you is. You may not know it, but I know what God's will for you is. Sounds rather kind of blase, that, doesn't it? But I know what God's will for me in the third step. You know, God wants me, he's one of his kids, One of his alcoholic kids, he wants me to be clean and sober, happy, joyous and free, helping another one of his kids. That's what he wants for me. He wants me to be clean and sober, happy, joyous and free, helping another one of his kids. I know that. It's very, very clear to me that. And he wants that for you too, if you'd be alcoholic. But he says to me, Mick, he says, I gave you a life, do with it what you want. But don't hurt one of my kids, that offends me. So Gus is his name, my, 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 my guy's Gus, G-U-S, the guy upstairs, you know, and uh, I'm in the business of offending Gus. So here I am, happy, joyous and free, helping another one of his kids. And I love that, I totally love that. Never had any inkling about that when I first got here, but I do today. And uh, the 40th anniversary, wow, happy, joyous and free. What a blessing, how about that? I've had a great day today. You know, I was uh, exhausted traveling here from L.A. Uh, yesterday. I had a great day today. Just had a great dinner. Just had a delightful dinner. You know, thank the committee. Al's been taking care of me. You know, we went to uh, flea markets and thrift shops and Christ knows what else today, which I love to do. I love rummaging around in these kind of things and picking up little treasures. And Just had a great day. And here we are in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is the greatest thing in the world. 
My name's Mickey Bush. I'm an alcoholic. I'm in an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. I know what's wrong with me and I know what to do about it. That is a lot of shit right there and I never brought that in here with me. You know? I love that. I love the beautiful book, Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I love this book. Do you know what Alcoholics Anonymous means to me? You know, because I haven't come here to offend anybody tonight or, or upset anybody, but I'm good at it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, you know, just in case I may offend you or upset you, I'll tell you what I'm going to talk about and what's, what's important to me. Alcoholics Anonymous. Look, A-L-C-O-H-O-L-I-C-S, Alcoholics. A-N-O-N-Y-M-O-U-S, Alcoholics Anonymous. This is what it means to me. A life centered on helping others lives in complete sobriety. Actions, not our names, yield maintenance of unity and service, which is our legacy in which we've all got. You can appreciate that if you like. And that's all it is, isn't it? That's all there is. So if I offend you and you want to leave, you've heard everything I'm going to say anyway. So, you know. But I, I love being an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous and uh, I'm more thrilled today to be among you than I've ever been. You know, I've, I'm coming up on 32 years clean and sober. Clean and sober. Um, May, May 8th will be my clean and sober and I'm very specific about that. Um, uh, and and uh, I'm more thrilled to be an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous today than I've ever been. It's more thrilling and more exhilarating to be here with you today than it's ever been. And you know what? If you were to say, here's a thousand dollars, Mick, tell me the last two days in a row that you didn't go to a meeting, I wouldn't be able to take your money. I love going to meetings. I love being an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous, going to meetings. I go to meetings, lots and lots and lots of meetings. I love going to meetings. Number one, uh, re one, number one reason for relapse, people cut back or stop coming to meetings. Yeah. So I ain't going to risk that, and I love. I, I, I can't remember the, the last two days in a row that I didn't go to a meeting. I, I have a vague recollection of an odd day here and there, but... You know, I, I don't recall it. I go to meetings all the time. I've just, I've just recently moved home from Santa Monica, California, down to Belmont Shores, California, which is, you know, just on the outside, outskirts of Long Beach, California. And I totally love it. I absolutely love it there. And when I went down there to, to Belmont Shores, I didn't, I didn't sort of know the, the, um, the people that I was familiar with up in Santa Monica. Um, but, I was welcomed there and I was made to feel you know, one of the group and uh, I fitted right in. I've been on seven of the eight continents around the world. I've been a lot of places, doing a lot of times. And everywhere I go, I have friends and people to be a part of, be a small part of this great whole. You know, I love that. I love being a small part of this great whole of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I didn't know nothing, none of this when I got here. I had no idea. When I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was so sick. I was so sick when I got here. I was so sick that I didn't know I was sick. Do you know how sick that is? Do you know how sick it is to be so sick that you don't know you're sick? That's really sick. And if you're as sick as I was when I got here, so sick that you come into a room like this, a room full of alkies, good alkies seems to me, and you scan the room and you think, well, I ain't as sick as him. Do you know how sick, do you know how sick that is? Do you know how sick it is to be in a room full of alkies thinking you ain't as sick as the next guy? That's really sick. So if you're in here tonight wondering whether you is or whether you isn't a real alcoholic or not, I want you to know that I can relate to being as sick as you don't think you are. You know, really, really sick. And I never knew when I got here. I never knew. You guys knew. I never knew. I, of course, to do, do today, because like the beautiful book says, and like you promised, more has been revealed. 
And, and I do, I even wrote a word, sick, S-I-C-K, spiritually ill can kill. And here I was, dying of a disease I didn't even know I had. Now that's dumb. That's dumb, isn't it? You know, I mean, shoot, I'd rather be an alcoholic than a dummy, you know. I apologise if there's any dummies in the room that don't like that, you know. But I was so sick when I got here, I didn't know I was sick. No, I'm not an idiot. I'm not just good looking. I'm smart. You know, I've got creds. I've got street creds. I've got academics. I've got a PhD, for heaven's sake. Pretty heavy drinker. But, but I didn't know I was dying of a, of a disease called untreated alcoholism. Yeah. Now I'd had plenty of forewarning, I guess. I'd been around a lot. I got to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous under my own volition on January the 15th, 1983. Yeah. I, I'm the result of a 12-step call. That's why I do so much 12-step myself. I, I'm a result and a product of a 12-step call. And I didn't know I was being 12-stepped. You know, an English rock and roll singer that had been sober two and a half years at that time, still sober today, and uh, he was 12-stepping me. And I never knew I was being 12-stepped. I never knew it. I never knew nothing about nothing. And uh, he was conning me into going to meetings with him. You know, he said, Mick, you know, would you come to these meetings with me? I have to go to these bloody meetings and I feel lonely and I, you know, and I went, yeah, all right, I don't care. I'll go, you know, go to meetings. I've got nowhere else to go anyway. I might as well go to meetings. I'll go. So I went to meetings with him. And, uh, I don't really recall very much about that. You know, uh, I mean, because I was in a blackout most of the time. You know, because I'm a blackout drinker, you know. Any other blackout drinkers here? And the rest of you lying mothers. I know blackout drinkers when I see them. I never even knew what a blackout was. And I was blacking out all the time. And I was blacking out in meetings. And I was, I don't know. I don't care. You know, I'm just going along. You know, and he's taking me to these bloody meetings. I, I, I don't know what, I don't know he's a, you know, sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous doing what we do here. I, you know, 12 stepping and, and, uh, you know, carrying the message. But, you know, they say when the pupil's ready, the master appears, you know. January 15th, 1983. I came out of a blackout. Three Been on a three-day run. Don't know where I've been, what I've been doing. I'm sitting on my couch in my living room in, in West Hollywood, where I was living at the time. And if you're a blackout drinker like me, you know, you have, you, you, you have these blackouts, but... You, you, you don't remember everything and the little bits that you do remember you can't quite collate them they don't seem to mix and they don't seem to add up and, and you, you don't forget everything but you can't kind of place everything either And but you know things ain't right you know I never once came out of a blackout heading up a charity parade or do, giving a kid a toy or you know, you know doing something nice for someone. It was always like the beautiful book says, paid, P-A-I-D, pitiful and incomprehensibly demoralised, you know. And uh, here I am going, where the hell have I been? What have I been doing? It's Tuesday. Yeah. And I'm going, wow, you know, vague recollections. My best friend who I'd known all my life since we were little gutter snipes, you know, surviving of the Second World War in London, England, where we were bombed and, and, and survived all that, and we grew up and we robbed and cheated and lied and screwed our way around the planet a couple of times. And, and, and he was visiting from Spain. He lives in Spain. When we had to get out of London, you know, intercontinental flight to avoid prosecution, uh, you know, he went to Spain, I came to America, and um, he was visiting from Spain, and... Uh, you know, he was in town. We'd known each other all our life. And I, oh, he calls himself an international businessman. He calls himself an international crook is what he is. But, you know, and, and, and he's visiting and I, and I call him on the phone and he's really pissed off. Uh, and I went, what's the matter with you? What's wrong with you? And I didn't realize that that was what I always said. What's wrong with you? Not about me, you. And he said, it's all right. I know it won't happen again because I won't be in your company when you're drinking anymore. I went, what? He went, just piss off, he said. 
And I, I went all little inside, you know, went all hurt and twisted and, and what have you, and put the phone down. And, you know, I'm sitting there, can't think, and I just feel all inadequate and lonely. And Anyone know what I mean? Guilt, shame, remorse, anxiety, fear, worry, loneliness, apart from this separateness. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, no shit. You know? And, 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 and I'm going, oh, wow. And, and, you know, an alcoholic with a phone, and I call this other dude. Now, he's a, he's a celebrity he's a rock and roll singer, but he wasn't one of our criminal in crowd, you know, but he'd been around. We'd known him all our life in England and stuff. And, and I call him, call him on the phone, and he's laughing at me, laughing. Oh, what are you laughing at? He said, you. I said, why? He said, because you do weird shit, that's why. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? And he laughed, big belly laugh. He quit laughing for heaven's sake. You know? He said, I ain't had a drink for two and a half years. I said, ain't you? How come? I never realised he wasn't drinking. As long as I was, I didn't care who wasn't. He said, because I used to drink like you. I said, what do you mean? And he laughed. And big belly laugh. Keep laughing all the time. I'm a delicate dude. I've got all these feelings. You know? <laughs> He said, you don't remember what you got up to over the weekend, do you? I said, no. He said, have you spoke to your friend from Spain? I said, yeah, told me to piss off. And he laughed, big up, we quit laughing. What the hell happened? He said, well, it all started after you peed in that lady's dinner. I said, what? He said, don't you remember your rich friend from Spain took us to that smart Beverly Hills restaurant and in the middle of the restaurant you got all ticked off at some old dame and you got up and walked across the store, whacked it out and did it right in her plate. I went, oh my God. Because I didn't remember peeing in no old lady's dinner. <laughs> but, you know, it was familiar territory. I would do shit like that and, you know... I would, I would go back in that restaurant or that club or store or whatever the situation was the next day or the two days later and they'd go, oh my God, how the hell you got the balls to come in here after what you did? And I'd go, what do you mean? Because <laughs> I wouldn't remember and they'd call the cops or I'd be in trouble again or something else would happen like that, you know. And that's kind of familiar territory to me, you know. Are there any miracle drinkers here tonight? Any miracle drinkers here? Remember, this is a disease of denial. D-E-N-I-A-L. Don't even notice I am lying. Or D-E-N-I-A-L. Don't even notice it's a lie. I don't notice when I'm lying, and I don't notice when I'm being lied to, especially by the disease that tells me I ain't got it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Who relates to the voices that talk to you? You know the voices that talk to you? You know the voices I'm talking about. Them voices that just said, what voices? Them voices. You know them voices? Drive you crazy, them voices. Got a drink to drown the voices, for heaven's sake. Telling you shit. Weird shit. You know, and I, I don't know, and, uh, you know, I asked you, any miracle drinkers here? Not one hand went up. Nobody ever go out drinking and have a miracle develop in front of their very eyes? Nobody ever go out drinking and drink somebody good looking? <laughs> Anybody do that? No? Who done that? Anybody go? Yeah, denial, don't remember. I was a social drinker. Any social drinkers here? A couple of Al Anon folks, I guess. <laughs> I know you Al Anons are in here. I can feel you releasing me. I was a social drinker, I know that, because every time anybody said I'm going for a drink, I said, social I. <laughs> <laughs> See, my friend's laughing at me. I put the phone down. We're all little inside and just inadequate. Just have to get out of that house, man. I don't know whether you drink a drug like me, but when you drink a drug like I do and your skin don't fit and you just can't get comfortable and you just got to go, you don't even know where you're going, you just got to go. 
On my coffee table is a beautiful book, Alcoholics Anonymous. On top of the beautiful book, Alcoholics Anonymous, is a meeting directory. I have no idea where it came from, don't know nothing about it, don't know whose it is, what it's doing on my table. It transpired that the girl that I was renting out the bedroom to in my one-bedroom apartment, <laughs> who, who was paying the rent for the whole place, I had a sleep, I had a mattress in a closet just off of the lounge, and when you come out of the closet in West Hollywood, it means something else, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and she'd been busted, uh, and she'd been sent to the to AA meetings. Uh, she actually took a wrong way turning up a one-way street. Uh, she was an alcoholic, and um, uh, she'd smoked a doobie, and she got sent to uh, Alcoholics Anonymous by the courts. And um, she, you guys had given her a beautiful book and a meeting directory, as we do with our new folk, and... Um, She'd brought it home and left it on the coffee table, and there it sat. And when I, in my devastation, it was there for me. And I flipped through this meeting directory, and there was a meeting that I could walk to down on San Vicente Hill in West Hollywood called Architects of Adversity. And it had to, I'm glad it you know, was there because I had to get out of the house and I could walk to this meeting. It wasn't too far away. And the unmanageability of the first step, I had a little red sports car in the garage, but it hadn't run for three months and wasn't going to run that day either. So I had to get somewhere where I could walk to. And in, in where I come from, and where I live, you can hardly spit without hitting a meeting. I know you've got some good meetings here too in Wichita. Yeah. And I walked down to this meeting. I walked out of this meeting. Now, I told you I'd been going to meetings, but I hadn't been going to meetings under my own volition. This was the first day, then, January 15th, 1983. As I walked out of that meeting, I don't know nothing about nothing. I don't know nothing about Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know nothing about being an alcoholic. I never came here with the only requirement for membership. I had no desire to quit drinking. Never knew anything about it. You know, I don't know nothing about a home group, I don't know nothing about taking part in your own recovery, I don't know nothing about doing commitments at meetings, I don't know nothing about nothing. And as I approach that meeting, there's two dudes standing outside. Today, of course, I know them as greeters, like you was greeted me to here today. But I didn't know then. And as I approach that meeting, one of those guys stepped forward with his hand out like that. I said, what do you want? He said, I want to welcome you to AA. I said, what? He said, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, what? And the other guy stepped forward. He said, keep coming back. I thought he said, keep coming on my back. I said, what? <laughs> he said, keep coming back. I said, what for? He said, we love you. I said, I bet you do. <laughs> you know, when dudes tell you they love you in West Hollywood, you get a bit nervous. You know? I snuck round them and went to the little community centre there. And I stood in the doorway of that community centre in a little room, and uh, there's about 20 or 30 folks in the room, a couple of celebrities I already knew there, and the room was full of smoke, and, you know, everybody smoked then. And, and, and I looked into that, that room, and, and I went, Wow! Wow! What is this? First thing I noticed was that everybody in the room was talking. Everybody talking. Nobody listening. Everybody talking. Wow. And you know what? I've been saying wow for 32 years ever since. I still say wow today. I walked in that... I walked into that room, and down the centre of the room came another English rock and roll singer, and he walked up to me and he put his arms around me. I said, what are you doing? He went, giving you a hug. I went, get away from me, you bloody pervert. Get away from me. I don't do hugs and shit like that because I don't know how to live decently. I don't know nothing about love and kindness and, uh, and all that. You show me love and kindness, I take that as weakness and just gobble you up and hurt you and take what you've got. He put his arms around me, giving you a hug. He said, we've been saving you a seat. I said, what for? I said, what are you doing here anyway? I said, you're bloody mental, you are. He said, I'm, t I'm 22 months sober. I'm leading the meeting. 
I wasn't impressed. I can remember taking half a step back going, oh, I don't want to catch that. Sober, what's that? And he said, talk to these guys. I said, I don't want to talk to no guys. He said, that's what we do here. And we do, don't we? We welcome our new folk as you welcome me. And we talk to them. We encourage them to come back and stuff. These guys wouldn't shut up. They were in my ear. They had their nose in my ear. Talk, 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 talk. Yes, 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 yes. okay. And then what they were talking about was like driving me crazy. You know? One of them got in my face, got in my face and said, you're an alcoholic. I said, what? He said, you're an alcoholic. I said, that's a bloody mean thing to say to somebody. Why would you say a mean thing like that to somebody for? He said, you're an alcoholic. Our beautiful book, don't say we don't tell folk they're alcoholics. It says we prefer not to. When Bill and Bob did Bob, D, uh, Bill D on the uh, third man on the bed, they said to him, anybody read this book, by the way? Who reads the book? Anybody read? It's a good idea if you're alcoholic, read the book. You know, they told him, you are an alcoholic. He says, I didn't think much of that. You guys got in my face and said, you're an alcoholic. I said, why did you say that? He said, because if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck and sounds like a duck and smells like a duck, it's a bloody duck. Just because he's been taking some shit and thinks he's an eagle, no, you're a duck. You're a duck, I'm a duck. Quack, quack, he went... I'm blind. What is this, for heaven's sake? This is the bloody funny farm, man. Guys loving on you and shit, and ducks and eagles and shit. What's this all about? But I didn't know at the time that he was breaking through that big bad barrier of denial to give me the clue so that I could learn to fully concede to my innermost self that I was alcoholic because I didn't know nothing about it. And later on it became obvious that what he was saying about the duck and the eagle was what it was about me that made me alcoholic, that I didn't know. And I went round asking people, what is it about you that makes you alcoholic? What is it about us that makes us alcoholic? Guess what? People didn't know. How could I fully concede to my innermost self that I was alcoholic if I didn't even know what it was about me that made me alcoholic? And I went round asking, asking you, asking people, what is it about me that makes me alcoholic? Why, why is he saying I'm alcoholic? Because I didn't know. A lot of people knew what they did because they were alcoholic. A lot of people told me what the consequences and the results of being alcoholic were, such as, you know, can't control my drinking. Well, to control it, you've got to be doing it. If you're doing it, you're already screwed, so it couldn't be that. One's too many, a thousand ain't enough. Once I start, I can't stop. I can't stop from starting, you know. All that's true if you're alcoholic. It's not what makes me alcoholic. It's what I do and what I know about myself because I'm alcoholic. But there's something else about me that makes me alcoholic that is specific. I hope everything comes out all right. <laughs> you know, I was raised as an only child in a family of five children, you know. I got three sisters and a brother, not alcoholic. I'm alcoholic. My three sisters and brother ain't alcoholic. I'm alcoholic. Same blood, same family, same environment, same everything. I is, they isn't. Same genes for all those genes people. See, they don't know why I drink. I don't know why they don't. I asked them, why don't you drink? They say, I don't like it. I say, what? What don't you like about it? They say, well, if I have one too many, I feel sick. Sick? You've got to drink past that. <laughs> Who stops at sick? I don't stop drinking. I puke, but I don't stop drinking. They don't laugh. They think I'm weird. Any other weirdos here tonight? Yeah. All my life, people say, what is wrong with you? The hell's wrong with you? What is wrong with you? And they would ask me what's wrong with me as if I knew. What is wrong with you? Oh, actually, I've got a two-fold disease. It's an obsession of the mind, allergy of the body. Can't control my drinking. I don't know what's wrong with me. What's wrong with you? Why do you drink like you do? Why don't you drink like I do? Because they don't know, see? I, I mean, I don't know there's anything wrong with my drinking. That's just what I do. 
Well, my three sisters and brother ain't alcoholic, so they don't understand me. I don't understand them. They like a drink once in a while. Once in a while they get drunk. But come Monday morning, they take their kids to school, pay their bills and take care of their responsibilities. They don't end up in detox like with me. See, they don't know because they're not alcoholic. I is, they isn't. Well, guess what? They got two kids apiece. Well, I've got two kids. I ain't never been married. I ain't never had a wife of my own. But I got two kids and... uh, I got two kids and... uh, I is, my kids isn't. My three sisters and brother isn't, their kids are. That's what we're dealing with here. But getting back to the duck and the eagle story, that's where it was that broke through the barrier to allow me to understand and grasp what it was about me that made me alcoholic, that when I asked folk, they didn't know how to tell me. See, in the doctor's opinion, I found what the solution to that that problem was. In the doctor's opinion, it said, men and women drink primarily because they like the effect produced by alcohol. Well, that's what alcohol does for men and women. Not alcoholic men and women. They're all men and women. You know? Alcohol has an effect on everybody. Why wouldn't it? If the Pope was to drink too much wine at Mass, he'd stumble down the stairs. Alcohol has an effect on on human beings. Men and women drink primarily because they like the effect produced by alcohol. It changes how they feel. Well, when we're alcoholic and we continue our drinking and we drink over what we call an invisible line and become alcoholic, like the book says, we become alcoholic, not born alcoholic, become alcoholic, the rules change. Now the rules have changed. Now I'm not drinking alcohol to change how I feel. Now alcoholism is changing my perception of reality. Alcohol changes how I feel. Alcoholism changes my perception of reality. Alcoholics Anonymous changes my perception to reality. See, it it takes me from restless, irritable and discontent to a sense of ease and comfort after taking a couple of drinks. Not ease and comfort, but a sense of ease and comfort. It changes my perception from restless, irritable and discontent to a sense of ease and comfort. That's what alcohol does for the alcoholic, that it doesn't do that for the normal person. We think it does, but it doesn't. Ask her Alan on Friends. That's what happens with the duck and the eagle story. I go out drinking as a delicate little duck. I have a few stiff ones and turn into an eagle and go swooping around looking for prey. And that's not P-R-A-Y either. Mary and my own group down there in Santa Monica... She puts it as well as I've ever heard anybody put it. She's a delicate little dudette, is Mary. Badass drunk, is Mary. She says when she drinks, she feels wittier, prettier, and tittier. And I know exactly what she means. Alcohol changes my perception of reality. Wow. Wow. Holy shit. Well, why do I want to change in perception of reality? I want to change in perception of reality because I can't stand reality. I hate reality. Screw reality and screw you in reality. I don't like reality. And when I drink, it's the buffer between me and you and reality. And, I, and that's what I can't stand. Until it's been working like that for all my drinking career. But on January the 15th, 1983, a couple of things happened that I wasn't conscious of about happening at the time. Everything I know about myself and everything I know about this disease of alcoholism, everything I know about recovery from this disease of alcoholism is all in retrospect. I I never knew none of this when I got here. So if you're new here tonight wondering about some of the stuff you're hearing, perhaps it's going over your head or you don't understand it, stick around, keep coming back. Because more will be revealed, as it was to me and as we promise it will be to you. Stick around, because I knew nothing about nothing when I got here. But I do today, because you guys taught me and told me and loved me and and helped me. 
And, and I didn't know that I was alcoholic. I didn't know what it meant to be an alcoholic. I knew nothing about nothing when I got here. You know? But you guys did. What I brought to recovery, I don't know what you brought to recovery, but what I brought was a lot of hurt and hate. Hurt and hate is what I brought to recovery. On January the 15th, 1983, a couple of things happened that I wasn't conscious of at the time. What I brought to recovery, January 15th, 1983, was a lot of hurt and hate. I hurt and I hate everything. I hate women. I can't stand women. I hate homos and queers and anybody different. I hate black people, totally racist and prejudiced. I'm from London, England, living in Los Angeles, and I hate foreigners. I can't stand me. I hate you and get away from me. Don't come near me. And with all that torment and turmoil going on inside, I still have to try and present to you a picture of somebody you will like. Because when your higher power is what people think of you, if you don't like me, I'm screwed. And alcohol ain't working. Alcohol has stopped working. I didn't know it had been working. I spoke to a guy yesterday. He told me alcohol stopped working. I said, is that right? What happened? He said, well, I got drunk and went into a blackout and got locked up. I said, that's not alcohol stopping working, that's alcohol working. That's what alcohol does. Well, you don't understand. Oh, that's weird, I don't understand. You keep getting drunk, but I don't understand. That's that's weird, isn't it? See, alcohol doesn't stop getting me drunk, it doesn't stop rotting my liver, it doesn't stop getting me locked up and in trouble, it still does all that, but what it stops doing is stop changing my perception of reality. It no longer changes me from a duck to an eagle. It no longer changes my perception of reality so that I can be in this rotten world with you rotten people doing rotten shit. And I'm screwed. The second thing that happened that day was that I hit bottom. I didn't know that. I wasn't consciously aware of that. I looked for it in the beautiful book, Alcoholics Anonymous. I looked for Hitting Bottom in the program. He gave me a book and I read it, studying it, textbook. Study the textbook, don't just read it. I looked for Hitting Bottom. wasn't in the program. Didn't understand what it meant. I asked people about Hitting Bottom. What do you mean, Hitting Bottom? Because in the, in the beautiful 12 and 12, although Bill doesn't mention anything about Hitting Bottom in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous... In the 12 and 12, in the very first step, he says, why all this insistence that every alcoholic must hit bottom first? Because more has been revealed to Bill, the same as it's promised to be revealed to us. And although he didn't mention it in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, in the 12 and 12, more has been revealed to him, so he insisted that every alcoholic must hit bottom first. Well, that's some ballsy crap to say to a bunch of drunks, isn't it? Drunks who don't like authoritative figures and don't like being told what to do. Yeah, well, hit bottom on this, father mucker, you know. (laughs) But that's how important it is, because hitting bottom, far from what we say in our meetings being different for everybody, better not be different for everybody. There's no unity in being different, but people don't understand what hitting bottom is, though they think they do. And I didn't. And I went round asking, what do you mean hitting bottom? What's hitting bottom? What does hitting bottom mean? You'd be amazed at what I get told sometimes. So you'd be amazed at what some of you believe that hitting bottom is. You know, hitting bottom ain't different for all of us. Hitting bottom is the same for all of us, not different. What's different for us is the outside circumstances and conditions of our life. That may be different. But those outside circumstances and conditions of our life is not what hitting bottom is. People think they are and say they are and even describe them. I've heard it here today. I've heard some people with long-term sobriety didn't know what hitting bottom was. When I said what I believed it to be, they immediately tuned in. 
because they knew. It's just that they'd said what they said for so long to so many over such a long period of time, it had become like AA rhetoric. I call it the lip-flapping party line bullshit that you hear in meetings. Because our meeting, uh, you know, our message is being diluted and watered down by the fellowship in the meetings. That's a little tangent that I won't go to very far with tonight. But, but you know, hitting bottom, January 15th, 1983. H-I-T-B-O-T-T-O-M. Hurting inside, totally burnt out, turned to our master. I didn't know this disease had gotten me to turn away from the master. But that's what happened. One of the things was that I had the gift of desperation. Alcohol had stopped working, and I had the gift of desperation. Just happens to spell G-O-D, gift of desperation. Without knowing what I was saying, without knowing who I was saying it to, and without knowing what the consequences and the results of what I was saying was going to be, I can remember in desperation and despair, hurting so bad, going, help me, please help me, what's wrong with me? What am I going to do? And asked for help from outside of myself. Anybody know what I'm talking about? No shit. ASK, our saving kit. Help, H-E-L-P, his ever-loving presence. And when I turned back to the God that the disease had gotten me to abandon, because long before I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, the disease of untreated alcoholism had been working on me long before I got here. Long before I got here, I, I was raised in a religion. Today I work with two nuns, two priests, a rabbi and a Sikh, dedicated their life to the service of God and mankind. Couldn't stay sober. Long before I got here, this disease had gotten me to abandon all forms of God and spirituality where alcohol was concerned, not where people, places and things and the outside circumstances were concerned, where alcohol was concerned. The disease had gotten me to abandon God and spirituality so that along the path of life, sometimes quickly and sometimes slowly, the disease became the power in my life, dictating and dominating everything I say, do, think and feel, and in and of myself I'm helpless, hopeless and powerless to resist its demands and have to do what it wants me to do, which is drink. You think I knew that when I got it? Never had a clue. And this disease makes me do it even when I don't want to do it. This disease is cunning, baffling, and powerful. Remember, we deal with alcohol. Cunning, baffling, and powerful. This disease makes me do it even when I don't want to do it. When I absolutely don't want to do it, when every fiber of my body is against doing it, when every desire in the world is to not do it, I do it anyway. Anybody else do that? Yeah, no shit. (laughs) And I can't not do it just because I don't want to. I've got to not want to do it, but I can't rely on not wanting to do it. I can't just say no. I've got to not want to do it, then do these steps and this work so that I don't do what I already don't want to do. And if I ain't doing these steps and this work, or I ain't done these steps and this work, I will do what I don't want to do because the disease i got that I'm powerless over will make me do what I don't want to do. You think I knew that shit when I got here? <laughs> Never had a clue. Never had a clue. Never knew nothing about nothing when I got here. And I had no positive power in my life to combat the negative power of the disease. And that was a little bit of a stretch. I was talking at dinner with last night's speaker. Lovely, lovely man. We were talking about it. Remember we deal with alcohol, cunning, baffling and powerful. Okay. It goes on to say, there's one who has all power, that one is God, may you find him now. Wait a minute. One who has all power, that one is God, may you find him now. If i got to find him, it means I ain't got him. And if he's the source and he's the power over everything, and I'm powerless over alcohol, what, it, what powerless means is that I'm godless where alcohol is concerned. But that didn't jive somehow, because... 
This one who has all power, that one is God, may you find him now. But remember we deal with our cold, cunning, baffling and powerful. Did that mean that God's got all the power except the power that the disease has got? That didn't jive with me. I didn't like that. So I had to like work that out. See, this disease is the negative power. God is the positive power. But long before I get here, the negative power of the disease of alcoholism that I'm powerless over gets me to abandon God and spirituality so that along the path of life it becomes the power in my life and I have no positive defences against it and have to do what it wants me to do and I'm screwed. Untreated alcoholism that I never even knew I had. But you guys did. You guys did know. When in desperation and despair I turned back to God without knowing what I was doing and asked for help, although this disease had gotten me to abandon God, God hadn't abandoned me. And when I turned back to him and asked for help, he seemed to be looking over my shoulder. And he seemed to be looking over my shoulder and said, Mick, you silly bastard, I've been waiting for you to ask. Now get yourself over that 12-step fellowship sent me to you. I asked for help and he sent me to you because here was the power he provided for an alcoholic of my kind, your kind, our kind, the beautiful book says, to not have to drink today. Here it was, right here, right now. I don't know why people walk around Alcoholics Anonymous claiming they're powerless. Oh, I know it happens. I've got loads of examples of it happening. But why, why do we do that? Powerless is only mentioned once and that's in the first step. Otherwise, powerless ain't mentioned. Power is mentioned 66 times. That is so alcoholic. You know, I mean, powerless is mentioned once, power is mentioned 66 times. And we're all going powerless, powerless, powerless over everything, powerless over people, places and things, powerless over life and life's terms, powerless, 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 poor little powerless, I'm so powerless. Why do we do that? To me, that sounds like the disease getting me to deny the power that's in my life. Why would I do that? I turned back to God. I was helpless, hopeless, and powerless. But I turned back to God and asked for help. He came back in my life and sent me to you. Here's a 12-step spiritual fellowship. You guys introduced me to a big book, B-I-G-B-O-O-K, Believing in God Beats Our Old Knowledge. In the beautiful book was a program, P-R-O-G-R-A-M, People Relying on God, Relaying a Message. In the beautiful book was 12 Spiritual Steps. You said, get a sponsor. I said, what's a sponsor? You said, S-P-O-N-S-O-R, Sober Person Offering Newcomers Suggestions on Recovery. What do you mean, newcomer? N-E-W-C-O-M-E-R. Nothing else worked. Completely out of manageability. Enter recovery. Oh, shit. Well, what shall I ask him? What's in the book? Well, what's in the book? The steps. Steps? What do you mean, steps? S-T-E-P-S. Solution to every problem sober. I can come up with a solution for the problem, but I can't stay sober with it. But the steps will enable me to solve the problem, come up with, live happy, joyous, and free. Wow. Well, where'd you get this, like... Steps and it's a gift, a God given gift, G I F T. God is forever there. Holy shit. Well, have I got to do the steps? Yes, of course you've got to do the steps if you want to live happy, joyous. Does everybody do the steps? No, not everybody does the steps. Oh, well, why have I got to do them? Well, you ain't got to do them if you don't want to. You can be like those folk down in Winchester who don't do them. Well, what are they like? Oh, they're nuts. <laughs> what, what do you mean, nuts? N-U-T-S, not using the steps. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, why do I have to use the stops? So, so you stay sober. Sober? What do you mean sober? S-O-B-E-R, son of a bitch, everything's real. That's why. <laughs> Happy, joyous, and free. That's why we do that. But I don't know none of this when I get here. How do I know this? I had to rely on you guys to teach me and show me and tell me. This power, this power that we have in rooms like this all over the world. We must have a power in here, mustn't we? We must have a power in this very room right now 
that we can take out there to enable me to not have to drink when I suffer from a disease that's more powerful than me and makes me do it even when I don't want to do it. I must have a power, mustn't I? Otherwise, when I go out there, I'll have to get drunk. Now, I don't know Wichita very well, but I've got a feeling it ain't ready for 400 alkies to go out and get shit-faced tonight, you know? So why do we say we're powerless, for Christ's sake? I've got so much bloody power over alcohol, I don't know what to do with it. As long as I stay here with you, being a small part of this great whole, which I love so much, you know? We've got so much power over alcohol here. And, and yet people... They, they, talk, they walk around flapping their lips, talking out the side of their neck, talking jive that they've heard around here. In one of my houses down there in LA, I, I got two parrots, a blue one and a green one. Bill and Bob is their name. And I trained them to speak. And you, you can stand very close to the cage, very quietly, and all of a sudden they go, I'm an alcoholic! I'm an alcoholic! Powerless! Powerless! They're bloody parrots is what they are, but they can say they're alcoholic and powerless. And I didn't want to be a bloody parrot walking around here talking jive that I didn't understand because I heard somebody say it, so I repeated it because it sounded all right. You know? So I wanted to do what this is, and I had a responsible responsibility to do that. And that's why we have to do this thing. You know, I don't walk around here claiming I'm powerless over alcohol. Why would I do that? If you want to have a bit of fun with your sponsor or maybe your sponsees, I'll give you a little bit of fun to have where the first step's concerned. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, our lives had become unmanageable. We've never done that. We in Alcoholics Anonymous have never done that because we ain't powerless. We are a power so strong we can resist the obsession to drink. You were powerless, I was powerless, but we ain't powerless. We have been a power so strong ever since Bill met Bob. We've had a power greater than ourselves that we can absolutely rely upon. In the beautiful book, it says, with this attitude, you cannot fail. And in Dr. Bob's story, it says it never fails. I know that, I know that Bill says rarely have we seen a person fail, but you know, he, he edged his bet, didn't he, Bill? It's funny, I read that funny too. Rarely have we seen a person fail or thoroughly follow their path. Those who do not recover are those who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. Usually women who are constitutionally incapable of being on... <laughs> oh, you are listening, huh? <laughs> be careful of that laughter, folks. You know, you've got to be careful of that laughter. They say, if you're laughing, you're relating. And if you're relating to a sick bastard like me, there ain't no doubt about you, pal, I'll tell you that. I don't get through to no well people. Well people don't laugh at my shit. You know. My mum don't laugh at my shit. You know, every year I go home to London, England, where I'm from. I'm from London, England. You probably picked up on that, right? This is the way I speak. Alcohol didn't do this to me, you know. I go home to London, England, see my mum. First thing I do when I hit the shores, I go round, knock her up, and I tell her, Mum, I'm 32 years sober. She says, so is the cat. You know? <laughs> she don't give me no pat on the back for not doing something I shouldn't have done anyway. I'm going to bingo. She says, I'm busy. You know? But we do, don't we? We, we come together and, uh, and we do together, happy, joyous, and free, so that we can live without drinking in this beautiful, wonderful world. I just got a couple of minutes here. If you don't think this is worth it, I'll give you a little reason why I think it does. My mum just passed a little while ago. She passed and my three sisters were sitting around the bed and she was going in and out of a coma and she, uh, she sat up. My three sisters told me that one minute she she was laying back as if, as if she was gone. And then she sat up. And they said, Mum, are you okay? You, 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 what's up? She had a big grin on her face. I said, Mum, are you okay? She said, Mickey's go doing good in a Alcoholics Anonymous in America. And she, she lay back and passed. I come out of nutwoods for the criminally insane. 
I'm certified insane in four different countries. I've ravaged my mum's life. How does it happen that a guy like me can put a smile on an old lady's face as she goes to meet her maker? Right here is how that happens. Right here in Alcoholics Anonymous. I ain't the same guy who came in on January the 15th, 1983. I'm no longer broke, busted, disgusted and not to be trusted. I'm a very wealthy man financially and materially. But my greatest asset is that loving God you taught me about that I never brought in here with me. I would so, no sooner leave my house without any prayers than I would without any pants. And in the beautiful book it said he can choose any concept of God he likes provided it makes sense to him. That's a condition. This book is full of conditions. This book that says of itself, our book is meant to be suggestive only. It may have meant to be suggestive only, but it ain't. It's got clear-cut, precise instructions, directions and rules to follow. He can choose any concept of God he likes provided it makes sense to him. I ask my troops, give it to me. Give me the sense it makes to you. It ain't going to make sense to me, but I want to make sure that it makes sense to you. Give it to me. What do you mean? I don't understand God. I hear speakers stand at podiums like this and say, God, as I do, I don't understand. That's not our program. It's a wonderful thing. They tell me there's probably 400 people in the room here tonight. There may be 400 different concepts of God in this room, this very room, right here, right now. Whatever works for you is okay with us. We have no truck with anybody's preference along this line. If you're atheist or agnostic, this program still works for you. This program is a power greater than me. Me plus you is a power greater than me. You plus us is a power greater than you. Together we can do what I couldn't do alone. I couldn't stay sober, you couldn't stay sober, but together we can stay sober. We can do what I couldn't do. We ain't powerless in this room right here, right now. And guess what? If there's 400 different concepts of God in this room right here, right now, they've all got at least one thing in common. Know what that is? No matter what concept of a power greater than yourself you've got, and this power works for all pe all alcoholics. You know, we don't care what, what they are. All the gods have got at least one thing in common. Know what that is? All the gods send their alkies here. Because <laughs> here's the power they provided for an alki to not have to drink today. Here and now. Right here, right now. I ain't going nowhere. I'm staying right here with you. And when I got home from that very first meeting, I had two telephone numbers in my hand. My telephone numbers, if you want them, is 818 area code, are you sober? 818, are you, like Toys R Us, 818, are you, S-O-B-E-R. I've got another number, 818, are you clean? C-L-E-A-N, completely leaving every addiction now. If you want to get through to me, you can dial one of those numbers and it's forwarded to my cell phone, which I've turned off. 818, are you sober? And I, get, I tell you that because when I got home from that first meeting, I had two telephone numbers in my hand. I don't know the format, I don't know what to do, I'm all shaky and smelly. They tell me I was grey, shaky and smelly when I showed up. I was all bewildered and dazed. But guess what? I've been an active member ever since day one. How do I know that today? Because I called one of the numbers. I know you don't, but I did. A guy answered the phone. I said, I don't know who you are, pal. I said, but I've got this number in my hand. Oh, he said, uh, I recognize your voice from the meeting at lunchtime. Oh, I said, was you at the meeting? He said, yeah, I gave you the number. <laughs> 
I said, what about them meetings? He said, what about them? I said, you go to them meetings? Yes, he said, I go to them meetings. I said, when, how often do you go to them meetings? He said, I go every day. I said, is that right? I said, you go to them meetings at night? He said, yeah, I go to them meetings at night. I said, will you, can I go to one of them meetings with you tonight? He said, well, normally I would say yes, he said, but um, he said, I've made arrangements to meet some friends and go to a movie tonight, so I ain't going to go to a meeting tonight. I went all little inside, didn't I? I felt rejected again. I said, oh, all right, don't matter, don't matter. And he picked up on it like we do. He went, wait a minute. He went, holy shit, what is wrong with me? I said, what's the matter? He said, you may have just saved my life. I said, no, I've never done nothing. <laughs> he said, Damn, he said, a newcomer, four months sober, and a newcomer wants to go to me, and I tell him, no, I'm going to a movie. Holy shit, what's wrong with me? Where do you live? I'm coming round to pick you up. I said, what about your movie? He said, you're much more important than the movie. I went all special again, didn't I? (laughs) He came round and picked me up. He was a, a weirdo. He had this little Fiat car, but he had it all decked out like a Mercedes. You know, got me first lesson in grandiosity. You know, <laughs> took me to a meeting, got me a beautiful book, Alcoholics Anonymous, third edition. Still got it, got lots of miles on it too. I love an old saying, somebody told me that somebody who's got a book that's falling apart usually isn't falling apart themselves. And I haven't had a drink from that day to this. There's a little tangent to that story. A little while ago, I I got several houses down in uh, San Fernando Valley, and like you're doing here today, we put on special events and, you know, we participate. My troops got no money, but I teach them what you guys taught me, and I teach them how to be of service, and they contribute by their service, being, uh, you know, clean up and security and other things like that. I'm walking around this picnic. We had a beautiful picnic, musician's picnic, and walking around and I had my troops with me, and we were having a good time. I bumped into old Zachary, that all those years ago had taken me to a meeting, got me a beautiful book, Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, oh, hi, Zach, how you doing, brother? He said, I'm doing great, Mick. He said, I know you're doing great, he said, because I hear good things about you. I said, I'm doing great, I'm smashing. I said, what are you doing on this side of the hill, Zach? Because he lives in Beverly Hills on the other side of the hill. He said, I'm speaking at the meeting today. Oh, I said, that's cool. And it took me just half a second to realize 30 odd years later, he's still four months ahead of me. (laughs) It's a program of action. You know, and I know I get a lot of juice, I get a lot of rah-rah, and some of you give me credit for even saving your life. It's all right you saying it, as long as I don't believe it. I was just told that I was a celebrity in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was over in San Fernando Valley doing some business, and I visited the old home group. Got to wrap this up. And there was a... I went to the old home group there, and I came out of the meeting, and... There was a couple of celebrities there, a couple of uh, Academy Award winning actresses that you all know by name and known in many years, active members of Alcoholics Anonymous. As I came out, I said, oh, hi, Mick. I haven't seen you in a while. I said, yeah, I don't live in the neighborhood anymore. I thought I'd come and visit the old home group, see how you're all doing. I'm glad to see it's a good meeting, even though I don't come here anymore. You know? One of them said, do you know what, Mick? They didn't realize what a celebrity you've become in Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, what? She said, you're like this guru type guy. You go around speaking all over the world and everybody knows you. I said, what are you talking about? She said, I'm making a movie in New York. She said, and I I went to two meetings in New York and in both the meetings, they mentioned you, they quoted you and mentioned you by name. You're like this 12-step celebrity. I said, yeah, bloody big deal, a celebrity in an anonymous program. (laughs) Yeah, I said... No, you're a celebrity. I'm just a clean and sober member. I'm just a small part of a great whole. And I love that. I love being a small part of this great whole. Namaste.
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.